Good, mo- good morning, good morning, Pursuit Church. Let's find our seats. Get ready to worship God. I'm glad you guys made it. We made it to Sunday. We made it this week. We made it through the December thunderstorm. Only in Texas, probably not only in Texas, but definitely in Texas, we will have a December thunderstorm. Why everybody else gets snow and ice. So I'll take it, I guess, over the snow and ice for sure. It's good to see you guys. If you didn't make it today and you're joining us online, good morning to you as well. We're so glad that you are here. Let us go to the Lord in prayer before we worship. And Father, thank you for this morning. Uh, just thank you that you are the provider for everything that we need. And that we don't have to worry about tomorrow. We don't have to worry about next week. You tell us not to be anxious and to worry about tomorrow. That we can focus on you today. That you give us everything we need for today. And that's all we can fo- have to focus on. Father, we're so thankful. Even Paul says that whether we have a lot or we have nothing, whether we're here hungry or we have everything we need, that you are perfect for us, Father, that you are everything that we need, that you will always be there for us, you will always provide, and we're so thankful for that, Father. May we just give you everything, any burdens that we have, may we put it down at your feet this morning, may we put it at the Christ cross that you died for us, that we can look to you today, that we can worship you, that we can lift your name on high, King of Kings. Father, we love you, and we're so thankful for you. So thankful for the free gift that you give us, for the love that you give to us unconditionally. That agape love, that you loved us. You loved the world so much that you sent your son. Father, may we worship you this morning with our whole hearts with our whole soul, with everything that we have, may we give it to you this morning. Whatever that is, may we give it to you. May we surrender everything to you this morning in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's so good to see everybody this morning. Boy, I I don't know about you, but I could use some time in worship with our Father. So if you guys would, go ahead and stand with us this morning. Let's make a joyful shout before the Lord. I don't know what your week has looked like. I don't know if uh, it's been a tough one. I don't know if you found yourself on the mountaintop this week. But there is always a reason to come in here and to bend our knee before God and to worship Him. He is worthy of every sacrifice of praise that we can make. This morning we're going to start off with a new Christmas song called Hope Has a Name. And remember that there was a time in history... God became man. He became man that we may live. So let's praise him for that this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's do it.
Lord, we know that there is a moment in time, Lord, where the end of one age came, the end of the law and the prophets, and Lord, behold, a new day had come, for the Christ had been born. And God, we celebrate this season and in rich understanding that God, if it wasn't for the incarnation, if it wasn't for the fact that you left heaven and became man, Lord, we would have no no chance for redemption, no opportunity to be bought back from death and from a Christless eternity apart from the God who's loved us and created us. But God, you made a way for us. Lord, we, we bow our hearts in humble gratitude and thankfulness for the cross and thankfulness for the incarnation. Lord, thank you that you've brought us near. And Lord, I pray that this morning would be a morning of deep reflection and of love towards you. God, may your praise truly be on our lips this morning. And may we have glad and grateful hearts. Lord, let not this morning be just a morning of familiarity with church, with song. Let us not miss the opportunity this morning to enter in, to worship you and to adore you. Lord, we pray that your presence may manifest among us this morning. Lord, that days of, of joy, jubilation, but also weeping over the gratitude that we have for what you've done. Oh, God, may that come on us this morning, that we may lift up this last song in gratitude. You've been so good to us, God. Thank you for everything you do. Lord, that we may truly be able to understand the love that you have for us, the sacrifice that was made for us that we may live. Let us draw close to you this morning, Lord. I want to be close, close to your side. death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Let's sing that one more time. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy.
The demons run and flee at the mention of the name King of Majesty. There is no power in song we're singing to our savior that we're singing to christ that he has all authority he has been given all authority in heaven and earth not some not a little bit not most of it every single bit all authority that we can seek after the king of kings who has all authority not just in heaven but here on earth everywhere he has all authority that we can submit to this king we can seek and seek after this king and he invites us to do that i'm so grateful for that it's good to see you guys if you're new here um, on, there's some black sleeves on the back of the chairs or some connect cards. If you'll fill those out to the best of your uh, ability or liking or comfort, uh, drop them off in the back of the offering box. Uh, it's good to see you guys this morning. Uh, I do want to bring up, we have our worship night next Wednesday, 6.30 to 8. Uh, I have to look at my notes. Next Wednesday at some time. We'll, we'll, we'll remind you and post it as well on our community page. But 6 to 8. 6 to 8 next Wednesday on the 23rd. Hope you guys can be there. It's going to be a great night of worshiping our Father, worshiping our King of Kings, and just being able to fellowship and be together uh, at this time of the year and this season. We're so thankful for that. Take a couple of minutes. Take the next two to three minutes. Say good morning to each other. Some high fives, elbow bumps, hugs, whatever you feel like. Uh, we're just so thankful for that you're here. Just embrace and, and be with each other, fellowship, and then we'll get back for the Word of God. Thank you, guys.
Well, good morning. Oh, I hope you guys are all doing well this morning, and I hope uh, the change in the weather and everything else has you feeling all right this morning and not too drugged down. Um, I tell you what, I'm, I'm tired. A nap is in my future, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it. John, would you bring my volume down just a touch, brother? Well, like Richard was saying, um, we do have a worship night coming up, and we talked about this last week, that because Christmas seems to fall on a rather strange day, um, Friday, it, it just seems so far away from a Sunday to me that we're going to be having our Christmas service five days before Christmas even comes. is bizarre and weird to me, but that'll be next week, so don't miss that. But um, additionally... We are going to be having a worship night, not Christmas Eve, but Christmas Eve Eve, so the 23rd. It's going to be on Wednesday. It's going to start at 6 o'clock, and we're probably going to end some probably around 7.30, maybe 8-ish, depending on how uh, long-winded some of us get, but uh, there's also going to be coffee and apple cider and, and snack food and stuff like that just for us to be able to hang out and fellowship for a bit for Christmas, but... Uh, I hope you guys make it for that. That's going to be a time that we can come together and really reflect on what God has done. And hopefully by next Wednesday, all your Christmas shopping is done and that's not on your mind. Um, Cindy started for the first day yesterday for us. So as, as every year, um, yeah, we, we are not prepared at all. So December 23rd, next Wednesday, come be here for that. Be here with your family. Let's worship the Lord together. Seek him and thank him for what he's done. And speaking of which, let's go ahead and pray and get into the word today. And Father, we, we don't desire to just come to your word this morning, Lord, to, to read a passage that maybe we've read before, to uh, come in to check off the box of our Christian walk so that uh, we can feel good about ourselves when we leave. Father, we come here to study a word that has been passed on throughout the generations to us in a trail of blood it has been given to us. Lord, from the times of the martyrs of the, of the uh, prophets up until even now, God, blood has been spilt that we in this generation may have the preciousness of this word before us, that we may be able to dig into it, to dig out the rubies and the pearls of what the living God would have us to know about life, of how you would have us to walk our life. Lord, these are your words, and I pray that we come to it this morning with a whole heart, with a desire, Father, to allow the word to speak to us, to change us, to move us, and Father, that we may glory in this word this morning. So Father, I, I know that I need your help this morning to keep my mind stayed on your word, Lord, if there's anything within my notes this morning that you would have me veer from to present something new, Lord, I want to be open to that this morning. But Father, I pray that you would also open the hearts of our people this morning, open the hearts of those who are online, and Father, give us a steadfastness within our spirit to be ready to do these things and to bring honor and glory to you. God, we love you, and we thank you, and we pray to you this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this morning, be in, be in prayer for me as I get going. My mind is all scattered since I've been sick most of the week. And this morning is uh, no different as I'm just tired and having a difficult time even trying to formulate a thought. So if I start rambling or start talking about weird things, just smile and nod. That, that would help me a great deal. But uh, we, we still find ourselves this morning in the series, The Valley of Decision. And we moved into this series to try to understand that as a people of God, that God has welcomed us near to him. It's so easy, I think, for us to get into the mentality of just doing life, um, of trying to make it to the end of the day and missing that there is truly a God that sets over history that has created all of us who desires daily that we may draw near to him and to enjoy him. And we see that from the beginning, that was the reason that God had created mankind, that we may fellowship with him, that we may know the living God, that we may become his representatives into the creation. And that is exactly 
when he placed Adam and Eve in the garden, what the role of Adam was to be, that he would behold the face of his God, fellowship with God, walk with him in the cool of the morning, and go out and be his representative in the earth. Of course, when mankind fell, the way, the entrance into God was blocked. And and we're going to talk about all of this a little bit more as we get into our text this morning. But I want to remind you of where we've come so far in this series What we've seen is the first steps of what God has called us into as a people. That this isn't just a lackadaisical faith that we're called to have, but we're to remember that there is a God that has called us near to him. And the first steps in order to draw near to him is that you and I, that we may surrender ourselves. That we may pick up our cross daily and follow him and begin to chase after God. And those are the first steps he's called us into. And we saw after that the heart of God. As God began to reveal his heart to us, he's asked us to come near, but understanding also that God moves forward for us, that we could never come near to God had God not first made the first move towards us. And we see that when he leaves the 99 and he goes to get the one lost sheep, when he searches for the one coin that was lost, when even with the prodigal son slaps his face and just desires the benefits of the father and not the father, How he welcomes him back with open arms, kills the fatted calf, and there's a celebration. This is the heart of the God that has drawn you and I near to him. And then last week, we went through a a difficult parable, didn't we? A difficult parable where we see that there is this unjust steward of his master's resources. Wastes them. And then the master... When he comes to him, he sees that he's done this unbelievable thing. He's taken the short time that he had left, and he's invested it so that he can have a place to stay with all these people that owed his master money last week. And God uses this unscrupulous man of how he does this in order to teach you and I a lesson, that our time here is but short And the resources that we have and the things that God has given us in our life in this time that we need to leverage for the kingdom that's to come. Not to lay up treasures for ourselves here on the earth where moth and rust, where they corrupt, where thieves break in and steal, but rather to lay our treasures up in heaven. And it's from there we dig into the sermon this morning. And the title of the sermon this morning is State of the Union. And there's an... There's a reason why I named it that this morning, because we're going to look at the state of mankind's union in two different areas this morning, and we're only going to be in three verses today, um, but I assure you there's a lot of text that we're going to be looking at today, but um, the two unions that we're going to look at this morning is, number one, the union of mankind with God's law, with the Torah, with the law, the prophets that had came before. What is mankind's relationship? What is our union now? to that law, and two, the unions that we have in our marriages. So today, we're going to take up the difficult task of talking about marriage and divorce. And what we're going to find out in in Luke is that this is actually the only time in the entire book of Luke that God is going to mention, that Jesus is going to mention divorce and remarriage. So I didn't want to just skip over that this morning and just uh, kind of run through it really quickly and get to the rich man and Lazarus, I wanted to give it its due this morning and really dig in as much as possible into these two areas. Um, And what we're going to find out this morning also is that this is actually, the idea of divorce and remarriage biblically at this time was actually a huge debate that was going on in the nation of Israel. A lot of divorce was happening at that time, not unlike um, where we find ourselves today in our nation, to where this has become such a huge issue for us, a huge issue within the church, to where we see that um, divorce now within the church is really the same level as it is in the world. The church has now become the mirror image of the world around us. And we're going to get a picture today from the heart of God over what his thought, what his love of marriage is, And how he's designed this. So again, we're only going to be in verses 16 through 18 today. Let's go ahead and read those three verses and start digging in. So verse 16, Jesus says, The law and the prophets were until John. 
Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, these verses, as we go through them, they, they may seem kind of odd to you. It may seem out of place. It, it, it seems just like it doesn't quite fit where we've been recently. And Jesus just gives this parable where he talks about the unjust steward that mismanages his, uh, his master's goods. And then all of a sudden, he enters into this talking about the law and the prophets and talking about divorce and marriage. So it, it feels like, where is this coming from, Jesus? Why are you even talking about this now? Why, why are we enter, entering into this discussion at all? And I want you to remember that at the end of him talking about the parable of the unjust steward, what Jesus, what ends up happening is, remember, he was talking to his Pharisees, but uh, he was talking to his disciples. It's going to be a long morning. Just bear with me. He was talking to his disciples, but remember, the Pharisees were listening as well. And what did they begin to do as Jesus tells the story? They begin to mock him and they begin to ridicule him. Why? Because even though it looked like from everything outward on these people that they loved God and they were following God to, in the most meticulous way possible, to the nation they would have looked like the, the cream that rises to the top of those who follow God, but yet Jesus exposes their hearts and their hypocrisy that even though they had this outward righteousness, the inward part of them, they weren't actually lovers of God. They were lovers of money. And it's in that place that Jesus says to them, it's you that justify yourselves before men. And he goes on to say that those things that are exalted in man's eyes are an abomination before him. So speaking to these teachers of the religious law that knew the Torah so well, they knew the word of God so incredibly deeply, had it memorized, He's beginning to expose that these people, they're not keeping the, the very law that they say that they keep. And so it's important for him here to say that the law and the prophets, they were until John, but since then the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. Think about what Jesus is saying here. For 2,000 years since the call of Abraham, for 1,500 years since Moses began to lead the people of Israel, a time had entered into history to where God began to reveal himself to man again. Remember, we've talked about this in the Valley of Decision, that God, when he created mankind, he created us to have fellowship with him. The God of all history, he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants us to enjoy him. And Adam and Eve walked with him in the cool of the morning until sin came into the world. And then we've said this so many times that all of a sudden, the entrance into the presence of God becomes blocked. The cherubim are set up in order to guard the way to the tree of life, into the presence of God. And all of a sudden, mankind begins to spread upon the, the face of the earth. And then all of a sudden, on Sinai, God comes down on the mountain. And he reveals himself to Moses and he sets up a temporary way in which mankind can approach the face of God again. He calls Moses up to the top of the mountain, delivers him to him this new way that mankind can now come before him. And it, was come, it comes through the law. It comes through the sacrifices. And remember, we talked about how the presence of God, it moves down that mountain and it comes to the tent of meeting and it rests there, enters into the Holy of Holies. And it's there that one time, just once in the year, that the high priest is able to go behind the, the two cherubim again, behind the veil of the temple, go into the holy place to where the glory of God was to atone for the sins of Israel. And what he would do when he would bring atonement by the blood of bulls and goats before God, all of a sudden, the nation of Israel were cleansed and they could draw near to God again. So what God had done in the beginning, he had re-welcomed Israel back to him, that they would be a nation of priests and kings, and they would take on the mantle of Adam, that they would go out into the world as the representatives of God again, and they would bring close the Gentile nations to him. So this was the purpose of the tabernacle. This was the purpose of the temple. 
that God could again come into the presence of his people. And because atonement was made that one time a year, the people of Israel could come near and be sanctified by their God as he would begin to transform them as the priests that were going to go out into the world. And it was from that time that God came down on Mount Sinai for 1,500 years later that the law and the prophets came. And now Jesus is saying that the law and the prophets, they were until John. The last 1,500 years of history has come to an end, and now God is beginning something new. And he's mentioned this before. In Matthew chapter 11, this verse will come up for you. Jesus said this, he said, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Think about that statement. What about Moses? Elijah? Enoch? Enoch walked with God and God took him. He was called the friend of God. Of all that came before John the Baptist, none is greater than John. Why? Because why everybody else might prophesy of the coming of Messiah, John actually is the one that gets to be blessed to be able to announce he has come. Emmanuel is here. God is with us. He gets to introduce Christ, the Messiah, to the nation. What an honor for John. But notice what it says after it. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's you and me. Have you ever thought for a moment that with the greatness of the things that the men of God and the women of God have done in the past, the Moseses, the Deborahs, the Elijahs, that you and I, at this point in history, being even the least of the kingdom or even greater than John and those guys... How, how can, did you look at yourself that way? Do you think of yourself and being in that place that of what God has called us to and what he's done in us is far greater than anything that he's done throughout history past? Why? What, what is it that makes us so great? What is it that makes what he's given to us so much more than even John or those that came before? That you and I get to go out to the world and that we get to present to people the full mysteries of God, the full gospel of what Christ has done, of how you and I can be reconciled to God. Again, not through the temple, not through a once-a-year blood sacrifice that comes that we may be able to draw near, but through this new and living way, Christ, where he shed his own blood, that you and I, there's not a temple in Jerusalem that we have to go to that you and I are being built together into a temple of the Lord. That as we go out from church today, the spirit of this God goes with us. We are a traveling tabernacle of God, being able to go out to let people know what God has done. And that glory that was in the temple, what God has done is now in you. Doesn't that seem almost impossible? That we, that we could live our lives sometimes in, in, it, with the lack of power that we live them or the lack of intentionality with seeking after God or the lack of holiness that we find in our lives. Think about what we've been given in this treasure that is within us. We have no excuses Though history may, we do not, of drawing near to God, being empowered by our God to go out and swing a hammer and make a dent in the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of darkness. Greater is the least of us than even all those that came before because of where we are in history and what God has done. So yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And you, you might recognize in that where it says um, that the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. In our verse today, it said, 
Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. What does that mean? Um, there's a few things that it can mean. I, honestly, I, I'm not exactly sure what it is that Jesus is getting at there. There's a few different things it could be, mean. Number one, it could mean that even though the Pharisees, the scribes, those who were kind of the gateway to God in Israel, those who were supposed to represent God to even their very own nation, they didn't come to trust in who Christ was. But regardless, the people were forcing their way into the kingdom past the Pharisees in order to come to Christ. That's, that's one thing that it could mean. It could mean that it suffers violence in that from the very beginning, from the very beginning of even righteous Abel, that the kingdom of God has suffered violence and that the violence they put to death, those that are the righteous before God, from Abel to all the prophets that were put to death, to John the Baptist, to Christ, to the apostles, to maybe you and I, that the kingdom of God has suffered violence in that way. I'm not sure exactly how Christ meant it there. He could even mean that the, those who, at this time um, that were claiming to be this Messiah were leading a revolt against Rome, and they were trying to take the kingdom of God by force that way. I'm not sure, but I do know this, that from the beginning, that what Christ has done has been heavily opposed by Satan, and God's plan throughout the ages in order for the kingdom of darkness to fall, that the kingdom of his glorious son might spread and that chains might fall off of our brothers and sisters outside of this building. It's for the church to rise up, to understand the power that it's been given, the atonement that's been made for it, the availability that we have to draw near to God and not hold anything back, but to understand who we are as a people and to press into it. Verse 17, it said, But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. And again, this is something that Jesus has been very, very intentional to talk about even from the beginning in Galilee in the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, this verse will come up for you as well, verse 17 through 18, Jesus said, Don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. In other words, I haven't just come to say this time period is done. It was done, and we'll see that in a moment, but he's not just coming to say it, it's time to no longer think in, in this type of way. Why did he come? So again, it says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but he's come to do something else. What? He's come to fulfill them. In other words, these types, these shadows, these ways in which God temporarily set up this sacrificial system so that mankind could draw near, Christ was about to do what was the picture in reality. He was about to come fulfill all that the Old Testament had talked about. Verse 18, he said, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. In other words, the whole of the book has been written of him, and he is coming to fulfill all of it. For what purpose? To realize the very thing that God created all things for, that this new and living way for you and I to draw near to God and to approach God would come, and he has done it. Now, this, this shouldn't have been something that was all that new for Israel to hear, they knew from even the writings of the prophets that there was coming a time period in history where all of a sudden things were going to change and a new covenant was going to come. Now think about being Israel and hearing it at that time, hearing you're the generation, you're the ones that all of a sudden it ends and something new begins. Can you imagine the awe, the, the, the disbelief even that that would bring to your heart? Is it really the time? Do I really get to be part of the one who gets to see the change from one t time period of God's movement to another. And church, I have to say to us that that same thing may be happening in our day. That 2,000 years later after the crucifixion, that the age of man, that the age of grace, that the time period that we live in may be drawing to a, ne to a near conclusion, to where the millennial age of Christ may come at any moment. 
we may be of that generation that sees that. And we certainly need to live in such a way to, under, to, to really show to, that this could take place at any, any point. That we believe it, that we trust it, and that we're doing everything that we can in this last moment to get the word out. And if these days are those days, uh, imagine thinking for a second that you knew the time of Christ's return. Nobody knows it. And it could not be for a thousand years. We don't know. But imagine if you knew that it was going to come December 15th of 2021. Imagine if you knew that. How would you live your life over the course of the next year? I guarantee you, you would live it with way more in intentionality than what we do. Way more mindfulness. We would redeem the time as much as we can. And even as I look at that clock that has... 26 minutes of a sermon counting down. How would I leverage that time if it was the last time that I would ever speak to you? What, what kind of fervor, what kind of zeal would I bring to you? What, what would I say in order to try to wake us up from the slumber that we're in in these last days? But even more so, as the day drew near, closer and closer to next year, how much more intentional would I, would I be? And I, I'm, I, 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 hope, I hope to present to us this morning that this is the way that we need to be living our lives. And this is even the way that the people of Israel at this time should have been awakened to the fact that now the time has come, the Christ is here, the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. The gospel of the kingdom is still going out. And you and I are accountable for the gospel of the kingdom. But again... The people of Israel, they knew that that day was coming at some point. In fact, Jeremiah prophesies it in Jeremiah chapter 31. This is about 600 years before Christ came. In verse 31, Jeremiah says to the nation, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. And in the time of Christ, it had came. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. And this is the covenant that was given on Sinai. Verse 33, for this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. God had made a promise to the nation of Israel that this covenant that's been given, the law and the prophets, there is coming a point in history to where it's no more. And I'm going to enter in at that point to a new covenant with the nation of Israel. And this is the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom that Jesus is talking about here that is now going out to the nation, that that time period has come. So what's happened to the law? In fact, in, in quoting these very verses in Jeremiah verse 31, in Hebrews chapter 8, the writer of Hebrews, he quotes those same verses from Jeremiah 31, but he adds this, and the verse will come up for you. Hebrews 8, 13, in speaking of a new covenant, he does something to the first one. He makes it obsolete. It's no more. It's finished. It's done. That was exactly the cry of Christ on the cross in his last breath. Before he gives up his spirit, he says, it's finished. In other words, paid in full. Uh, imagine you've accumulated a thousand parking tickets. There's a warrant out for your arrest, and finally you go before the judge, and you owe a, an incredible amount, a huge debt that you just cannot pay. But then all of a sudden, somebody comes into the courtroom, pays that debt for you so that you can go free. This is what Christ has done. The debt that we've owned, owed before God is unimaginable and it's greater than anything that we could pay. The law has condemned us as sinners. 
to spend a Christless eternity away from God. But Christ has come and he has paid that debt for you and I. Paid in full that you and I might live. No longer, no longer under the dominion of darkness. No longer under the law. But reborn. And this is what it means in Galatians 3.10 when Paul's speaking to the Galatian churches. And he says, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. You see, God, when he gave the law to the nation of Israel, what he was showing is this is the picture of perfection. This is the picture of what it looks like to have fellowship with your God. If you're going to fellowship with God, you have got to be perfect. No sin. It's the only way that God can communicate with man. But unfortunately, all of us have sinned. The law, all it can do is show us the perfect picture. It can do nothing in order to get us there. And every one of us, we've sinned, we've fallen short, and we abide in the wrath of God. But God, because of the great mercy in which he loved us, Christ has come. He walked the life that we couldn't walk. Perfectly obeying the law, never sinning once, and becomes the sacrifice for our sins. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. Can you imagine that? Living your life by your own self-righteousness and 612 of the commandments, you have just batted a thousand. You have done incredible. You failed in one thing, one impure thought, and it's a Christless eternity in hell. This is the standard in which God set. The standard isn't how much better than my neighbor that I'm doing. The standard is, am I living the perfection of the life of Christ? And that's the beauty of the gospel. So if all who are born in Adam are born under the law and therefore are guilty under the law, how is it that we can have a relationship with God if we are all guilty? This is what Paul says in Romans 7. My brothers, you have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who's been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. He goes on in verse 6 to say, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The law and the prophets were until John. And now a new way for us to approach God has come. See, what has happened was because we're in Adam, we stand guilty before God. But when we come to Christ, we understand that we died with him. The law no longer has any dominion over us. All it could do is curse us and show us the standard that we could never keep. But in Christ, we've died. And we've been raised new to now be able to come near to God because of the perfection of the atonement of what Christ has done. Draw near to God, be transformed by God, and serve God in a new and a living way. What a work God has done that you and I may be able to draw near to him. The law and the prophets they served their point in history, but now, because of the atonement of Christ, you and I, greater than all that came before us in the Old Testament time, filled by the power of his spirit to go out and to make a difference as his plan in this world to bring about the redemption of the human race. Oh, may we rise to the challenge of what God has given us. We are not under the law. We are now into a time of grace in which God's spirit is within us and that we may bear fruit for him. Let's look at verse 18 and let's talk about a very difficult thing that the Bible brings before us. Verse 18, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. 
Again, this is the only time in the book of Luke that marriage and divorce is even going to be mentioned. And notice that Jesus gives no exclusions here, no exclusions at all for what makes the disillusionment of a marriage okay. He gives nothing here. Why? Because when he's talking to the Pharisees here, he's trying to show the Pharisees that even though they say they follow God, they are not following God from the heart. In fact, the Pharisees would have said it was okay to divorce, but it's not okay to commit adultery. Jesus is saying, no, you're breaking the law because anyone who divorces his wife and marries another is now committing adultery. So Jesus is coming against the entire mentality of the Pharisees. Now, we know that this isn't the only time that Jesus talked about divorce and the different exclusions that are given in the New Testament. So we want to make sure that we have a, a complete understanding of this and we talk about it. So I, I didn't want to just blow through this without, number one, talking about the exclusions that God gave, but so that you and I can understand holistically the entire teaching over this and what the Bible says to us, because it's important. Now, what you may not realize is at this point in history, um, there's a huge debate going on in the, in the nation of Israel between how to interpret the Old Testament and how to understand what God gave allowance for, for divorce. And uh, this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 24, so I want to read that to you real quick. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 and 2, it says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if, the, if, she, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife. Now, that's going to seem like a really odd place to stop because it doesn't finish the sentence. He's going to go on there to say, if he goes and, and she gets married to this other guy and they end up divorcing, she can't go back to his first husband. We're not going to dig into the minutia quite that deep this morning. The reason not is because I just want to talk through um, really what was going on in the cultural debate at this time so that we can understand why Jesus answers these things the way that he does. But before we do that, and before we talk about the debate, let's look at just a couple of more verses real quick. And the first one is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. This is the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talking again about divorce. He says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, and here comes the exception, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, I want you to understand the, the, the tensing of the verb here. This doesn't mean that he continually commits adultery. It means that an act of adultery comes after that. But this isn't even the last time that Jesus mentions this. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 through 9, the question is brought to him this time based upon the cultural issues that are going on at the time and the debate that's raging. So the Pharisees come to him and ask a question. It says, and the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So this is the question. This is what's being debated in Israel at that time. Is it lawful to divorce for any cause? And this is Jesus' answer to that. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. In other words, what Jesus is saying the way that God has created marriage is that for a man and a woman to come together to bind themselves in marriage, period. This was how God created marriage. This was his design for marriage. Now, of course, the Pharisees, they understand Deuteronomy 24 and that there was an exception that was given. So they asked Jesus again. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Verse 8 his reply. He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. 
And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So again, the singular exception is given there. Now, let's talk through a little bit of the, the debate that was happening at the time because there were two major views that were going on in the nation of Israel at this time. One by a guy named Rabbi Shammai and another one by a guy by the name of Rabbi Hillel. And these two guys, they had two different views of what Deuteronomy chapter 24 meant. So Rabbi Shammai, what he said when he read Deuteronomy 24, when it said, um, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, the way Rabbi Shammai interpreted that was to say that that indecency that he found was something of a sexual nature. And the word that Jesus uses is pornea, which is really a, a big umbrella term. It's not just adultery. It's also uh, fornication. It's also bestiality, homosexuality. There's a lot of different things, incest that comes under this umbrella that Jesus uses. But Rabbi Shammai is the one that says the indecency that's found in her is of a sexual nature, and because of that, divorce can happen. Rabbi Hillel, on the other hand, took a differing opinion. And when it said that if, the, if she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some indecency in her, the way that he read that was indecency in anything. So the way that he interpreted it was to say, if he just found anything in her that he didn't like, in other words, if she, and the one that they always use is, if he even burnt her, or if she burned his breakfast, then he was able to divorce her for that reason. So these are the two main competing views and the reasons in which the Pharisees would allow divorce to happen. There was even a third view as well that um, some other people would take just the, if she finds no favor in his eyes, to be, even if he finds somebody that's prettier than her, then all of a sudden she's lost favor in his eyes and he can divorce. So this was the debate that was happening in Israel Lots of divorces happening, the Pharisees being able to sign off on it. And this was why Jesus brings such a heavy-handed no. If it happens, it is adultery. Now, is this the only thing that the Bible has to say about this? Um, because this is the way that Jesus presents it here. Is, is it even legitimate to have more than one marriage? Is it legitimate to have a second, a third? I think from Deuteronomy 24, we can say, yeah, absolutely. Um, because when the indecency happened, he divorced his wife, she went and married another. Um, in fact, in John chapter 4, uh, the story of the woman by the well, we see that Jesus, when she's talking to him, seems to legitimize that you've had five husbands up until this point. He doesn't say you only had one and the rest were, were faux marriages. He legitimizes them. But then he even says this, and the one that you're with now is not your husband, which, which brings up an interesting point to us, honestly, just to show that um, uh, the act of sex doesn't mean that somebody's married. Um, so she was living with this guy, having sex with this guy. That didn't mean that they were married. So again, Jesus seems to legitimize the five marriages that were there, but not the one that she was with at the time. So that's important for us to understand. But the, uh, the last question we have to ask ourselves is, is sexual immorality the only grounds by which uh, legitimized divorce can happen in the eyes of God? So for that question, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's going to be a little bit of a lengthy reading. Um, this is quite a, quite a bit of teaching that the Apostle Paul gave to the Corinthians. So let's try to understand it as best we could, and I'll kind of comment on it as we go through. But verse 10, he says, "...to the married I give this charge." Not I, but the Lord. So what's he saying there? He's saying, okay, what I'm about to tell you comes directly from Jesus. And we just actually read those verses that he's going to be quoting from here. So to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. So this is the general principle that we already know. That within the confines of a marriage, that if there's been no sexual immorality, at the very least, that's all we've determined so far, if there's been none of that, then there should be no divorce, they should remain together, but if they do separate, let them remain unmarried or let them be brought back together. So that's just the, the general rule that's been given from Jesus, 
not bringing in any exceptions up to this point, just simply marriage and how when we come together and we make those oaths, one man, one woman for one lifetime is the model that God has given us. So now comes the more difficult stuff. So that's the basic principle. Verse 12, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord. In other words, Paul's making an application here. Paul is He doesn't have a direct command from Jesus, but he's speaking with apostolic authority about the situation that the Corinthians are asking him about. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband, otherwise your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. In other words, what Paul is trying to represent here and trying to help the Corinthians with is even if your spouse is unmarried and you find yourself in the Lord, because remember, the gospel is going out to a pagan nation, and sometimes the wife is coming to the Lord, but the husband isn't. Sometimes it's vice versa. But what Paul is trying to show is, listen, it's still a holy matrimony before God. God still recognizes this as a holy union. Now, as you read history, what you'll find out is that in in the first century AD, um, as Christianity is going through the empire, there was actually some complaints by the Romans at the time that were saying that Christianity was actually um, causing the breakdown of the Roman culture because a lot of the people at the time were getting divorced. And the reason that they were probably tied back to the time of Ezra. When the children of Israel came back from their worldwide or from their dispersion in Babylon and they come back, they start marrying some of the Samaritan people that were there. And because of that, God actually has them to divorce their wives at that time in order to begin to follow his law again. And that could be where some of the Christians at that time thought, gosh, if I'm a I'm with an unbeliever. God seemed to do that same thing in the time of Ezra. Maybe we should be divorcing our wives. And Paul's saying, no. What God has brought together, he still recognizes your marriage. He still recognizes even though it's a believer and an unbeliever. So that's the reason Paul is saying this to the people. He's he's saying, "Don't, don't just divorce for that reason. And then in verse 15, he says, but if the unbelieving partner separates... In other words, if the unbeliever that, is, that you're married to, if they decide to leave, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. What does that mean? That he's not bound to that relationship. He's not bound to um, being married. He's free. And in other words, he's free to marry someone else. So if that unbeliever chooses to leave... The person that they left is not enslaved into that marriage, but free in order to marry someone else. So again, but if the believing partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So what he's saying there is, in the marriages that you have, if you have an unbeliever with you, stay with them. Why? Because through your godly example and the way that you live your life and your worship of the Lord, you never know. The unbelieving spouse might actually become a believer. So don't just separate for that reason. If they desire to go, you can let them go, but don't just separate for that reason. And then verse 17, he says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. And he goes on to say that this is my rule in all the churches. In other words, the place in which you find yourself right now, stay in it. Now, I, I, I can't begin to know what everybody's past is and what things look like up to this point in their life. All I can say right now is that the situation that you find yourself in now, the marriage that you're in, love that person with a self-sacrificial love. Hold that marriage in high honor before God. Honor Christ above everything in your relationship with one another. Now, there's two exceptions that's been given now biblically for us. Number one, the exception of sexual immorality, that, that, that God allows that to break the union. The second one that we just saw was in the case of an unbeliever who uh, wants to leave. 
and he says it's okay. But I, I think that any time we talk through this, I, th I think probably the same question that's on your heart right now is always on your heart, and it's always on my heart, and, it, and the question is, what about other situations? Is that it? Is it just merely those two, or are there other situations where God allows it, where he sees it as okay and where you're not enslaved? That's a challenging question. And I, I want to preface what I'm about to say by saying this, that what I don't want to do is I never want to approach Scripture in such a way that when I teach it, I become accountable for the things that people do that are ungodly afterwards. Let me say this before I say what I'm about to say, that marriage is held in extremely, it, it, is, it is pure. God hates divorce, and we should do anything within our power, anything, to remain together and to honor God self-sacrificially with that person in our lives. Please let that be said and be heard. But what about cases with abuse? What if there's safety issues within those marriages? Because the Bible doesn't speak to that directly, does that mean that... Um, Man, that, that person has to remain under there and suffer abuse. Is there any way that we can look at the scripture and, and help it to inform us in this area? And I think that there is. Um, and I think it goes back to verse 15. So if you look at verse 15 with me again, it says, But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. Notice that he doesn't say in such a case. In other words, as though that this is the, maybe the only other case. But he says, in such cases, the brother and sister is not enslaved. I, I do believe that this opens up the potential that there might be some other reasons why God would allow somebody out of a marriage. And I've got to think that uh, abuse and safety, whether it be for the spouse or whether it be for the kids, is one of those such cases that we need to enter into humility with. Now, I, I do want to say this as well. I, I think that a lot of times we have a tendency, just like the Pharisees, where Jesus says, it's you that try to justify yourself before men, that a lot of times we look at the situations that we in and we trump them up way more than what they are, and we do that in order to justify a decision that we want to make. And I want to caution us against that, that marriage is holy before the Lord that he would desire for us to stay together. I, gosh, I can't say that enough. That's, that's so important for me to get out. But I do believe scripturally that in such cases, we're not enslaved. That for cases of abuse, well, Trin, what about, what about drug addiction? What about... Um, what about alcoholism? What about gambling? What about different issues like that? I think that there's a precedent in the scripture that's given. Um, we see it in Matthew chapter 18 when it's talking about church discipline. And it says that if a believer sins against us and we go to that believer and we tell them their fault and they repent, then we've won our brother back. But if they won't listen to us, then we take two or three witnesses with us and go to that person. If they still won't, we bring it before the church. And if that person still won't repent, then we treat that person as though they're an unbeliever. And that's where church discipline comes in, and that's where somebody's asked to leave a church, of course. Now, we see that same idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it talks about these different things that people, these different sins that people can practice in order which we're to look at those people as unbelievers and even ask them to leave the church at that point. And there's a list of sins that's given there. Some of those sins include drunkenness. Some of those sins include sexual immorality. So I, I do think that there's a precedent set within the body of Christ that somebody may profess to be a Christ follower but in their life, they've never actually repented of sin, trusted the Savior, and began to follow him. And because of that, those people can be treated as unbelievers. Now, um, 
would I say that I think in cases of absolute extreme drug abuse and difficulties that God is okay with a divorce there, gosh, I, that, that's hard for me to say. I, I think every situation would involve just incredible amounts of humility, prayer, coming together, counseling, trying to work through these things, and, and keeping divorce as far away from us as possible. But I do believe that there's situations that come up, and I can at, at the very least say that I believe in cases of abuse, that in such cases that we need to seek for safety for people, and they're not enslaved in such situations. It's, I, I, I tremble even, even making allowances in those cases because marriage is something that is held in such high esteem. But, but again, I would say to us that what's happened in the past, if, there, if you find yourself in a second, third, fourth marriage, whatever, what, what do we do? How, how do we handle ourselves now? I, I, I don't think it's a good idea to make the situation worse than what it's already been. What is the call to us? To verse 17, let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. I believe that the way that we need to handle those situations is the place that you find yourself right now, that you are called to love your spouse with an unbelievably self-sacrificial love, honoring them, giving yourself to them, and that this is what honors God. So may we be of those people that honor God in that way and cherish the relationships that we have and honor the marriages that we have. Now, how does all this tie into the valley of decision and our relationship with God? I, I think in a couple of different ways. If, if we track back to, um, to the idea of the law, there's something within the human heart that we hear the words that we've been released from the law. And all of a sudden, our hearts arrive at a place of thinking, I can do whatever I want. All things are permissible for me. And what we do with our Christian walk is we try to see just how close to the line of sin that we can get without crossing over into doubting our own faith. Like, how close can I get to a lifestyle of sin, so I, I, I feel like I can have my cake and eat it too. I'm, I'm still a child of heaven. I've, I've still been brought to glory by Christ, but I, I, I can get so close to that line of sin. And I would just, I, I want to say to us, I want to plead with us this morning, that if, if that's your mentality, then, then you have missed the goodness of our Savior. What we pursue in our life, what we... What we set before us as the good life, it becomes revealed through our life as we begin to see the things that we press towards, the things that we begin to do. If, if, our, if our life is given over to, to some sort of sin or if we think that the good life is X, Y, or Z, our life is going to show us that because that begins to be the thing that we pursue, that begins to be the things that, that we think about. And, and it comes through our speech so often when we say things like, gosh, I've had a really rough day. I really need to find peace in fill in the blank. I really need that drink. Or I, I, really, need, um, I really need to just unwind and just watch a movie and, and not think about things. You see, so many of us believe that amusement or or the things of the flesh are actually what bring life. But Christ, when he comes to talk to us that it's him that brings abundant life, that he is the good life, true trust and faith in that isn't going to try to edge next to the line of sin as close as we can. It's going to be flinging ourselves wholeheartedly into Christ, pursuing him, seeking him in prayer, getting in his word, and, and Christian, I tell you, that that is the decision that you and I have to make. 
And it doesn't matter what we say right now. It doesn't matter if we say, no, I believe, I trust that Christ in him is all goodness. It doesn't matter if we say that right now. What's going to matter is what our life shows. That's going to show what we truly believe. So even though we have died to the law, we haven't died and now we're in a place of lawlessness. We have come to trust in Christ. We have come to trust that his path, his way leads to the flourishing life. And that's why even in our discipleship, when we go out to all the nations to share the gospel, to baptize them, it says, teach them to obey all things that I've commanded. We are not a lawless people. We are a people who have come to trust in the goodness of God. And may we pursue that. May our life show that we've trusted in that. And that's the decision that we have to make. What brings life? What do you really believe brings life? Whatever you believe, go after it. If you believe it's sin or temptations of the flesh and your love is there, go after it. But don't live in this place of going back and forth, this half-hearted, lukewarm, I'm for God, but I'm for my flesh. Crucify the flesh and its sinful desires, and you will find life. Christ is good. And secondly, in our marriages, I said this to you before, and I, I, I want you to hear my heart on this. And I'm being as truthful as I can about my own failures and my own lack of spirituality sometimes, the hardest place on this planet to practice your, your Christianity is not in the prison cell. It's not at church. This is the easiest place for me to look spiritual. The hardest place for me to show that I'm a man of God with integrity is at home and even more so with my wife. That's the hardest place. God has done you an unbelievable service. He has given you a gift called marriage. And for those of you who are married, this is a wonderful thing that God has done he, te he takes this person in whom you're called to love and to cherish, and he does something with that individual. He makes this person, perhaps, other than apart from the Holy Spirit, the greatest tool in your life for your holiness and your transformation. You will find this, the darkest corners and the recesses of your own um, selfishness at home, I found mine there. When all of a sudden, it, it's easy for me, like the Pharisee, to justify my attitudes before my wife, to justify the way that I speak to people because I have a right to feel that way because of X, Y, or Z. I have no right to feel any way. I have a right to crucify my life for Christ. To not hold anything over the spouse that God has blessed me with, but to love her, to cherish her self-sacrificially. Now, I'm not saying that there's not instances in some of your lives maybe to where maybe uh, the, the spouse is doing something that they shouldn't do and it's made things difficult. I'm, I'm not trying to say that, but what I am trying to say is more oftentimes than not, we always think that the problem with life is out there. Do you want to know what the problem with the world is? It's me. I'm the problem. And until I deal with me, then I'm going to make a wreck of everything else around me. So in our valley of decision, number one, let us not pull close to the lines of sin, but let us chase after Christ, understanding that he's welcomed us into intimacy with him. Intimacy with God is what's been opened up for us. That is amazing that he welcomes us into that. But two, that we wouldn't justify our attitudes, our actions, 
that we wouldn't blame the way that we are on anyone else, particularly the person that God has blessed us with the most. But we would use our home turf, our own home, to allow God to begin to transform our lives in a self-sacrificial way. And I, I, I promise you, church, it's in that place that you will find true freedom and you will find the glories of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let us commit ourselves to that. And let us chase after Christ with all that's in us. Let me pray for us. Father, what, what challenging thoughts this morning and what challenging scripture. Lord, I think that the more and more that we've gone through the book of Luke, God, the more and more we've seen that, that what you're calling us to is radical obedience. Lord, of fully trusting you, not holding anything back, loving you with everything that's within us, and that love transforming us to a place to where the, even the hardest relationships in our life, that love leaks out on even them. God, may we not hold within our hearts anything that, thinks, that, that we think causes us to justify our actions. But Lord, may we break ourselves before the throne of grace. May we come with humble hearts and with a poverty of spirit, understanding that, God, the problem isn't out there. The problem is in me. Oh, God, I pray that as we come before you and as we draw near and as we behold your glory and see your face, oh, God, that you would transform our hearts from glory to glory, that you would change us to be more and more like you because it's in that place that true freedom is found. And, oh, God, that we would live our lives mortifying sin, growing in godliness, and worshiping our King with a whole heart. Laying down all the, all the different things that try to pull us away. And trusting you finally and fully with everything. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that they've never done that. Lord, that they've never laid down their life. That they've never, that they've never come to that point of honesty to say, no, I've been, I've been pursuing my own thing. I've never laid down my life for the King of Kings. Lord, I pray that this morning they would understand that even though that they think they've done some good, that the standard is so high that they could never find it. They could never complete the work you've given them to do for holiness and to stand before you. That we must come before you on our knees in humility, understanding that we are but sinners but God, that through Christ you have made a way for us and that we can stand redeemed before you. So Father, if there's anyone here today that haven't given their life to you, I pray that they would lay down their arms against you, accept the sacrifice that Christ has brought, believe that you died for their sins and rose again, and that they would raise up and begin to walk life, bringing light to the people in their lives, bringing joy to the people around them, being your representative in the earth, following you, trusting you, not just having a mental assent, not just saying that they believe, but God, fully chasing after you. Oh God, may we be a church that rises up into all that you've set before us. May we understand that of all that came before us, that what you've done in us is greater than even Elijah. And Lord, may we live in that way, bringing you glory with every bit of our life. Father, for that person that has never confessed their sin and come to you, I pray they would do it now. And Lord, that you would save them, fill them with your spirit, and Father, that you would begin to do great things in them and through them. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we worship at your feet this morning as the holy God who has taken away our sins and given us righteousness. And may we rise to the challenges of the world that's around us, of this darkness, 
and may we be the sons and daughters of light. To the King, immortal, invisible, the only true God, the sovereign one who's created all things, we worship you and we adore you. And we pray to you this morning, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 If you guys need prayer, we're going to have prayer partners up here after service, after we dismiss. So if you have something or someone you need prayer for, something in your life you need prayer for, seek out for that prayer. Come to, come to the Lord with that. Um, we'll end with benediction prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word, like Trinity said before, that have gone through so many of our brothers and sisters that have shed blood to bring us your word, that you, we can have this. We can have your word that you've spoken to us, uh, that your son that you've given to us. Please just let us, as we go out through this week, let it, us open our hearts and our minds more and more to who you are, more and more to your word, to your teachings, to your love, to your mercy, to your grace. Father, I just pray that uh, safety this week for everybody as, as the holidays approach and um, things uh, seemingly get crazier around this time with everything already going this year. Just keep people safe, and uh, may you always be in our hearts and continue to do that. We love you, Father, in your name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.